we've lived in the Milky Way for all of our lives. It's our galactic home. But most of us treat it like a hotel with entire hallways full of rooms that we never look at and barely give a second thought. It's about time we bust open those doors and get to know our home galaxy a little better. This compilation of previous SciShow Space videos will take us on a journey through time and space, touring our galaxy's past, present, and future. We'll explore the Milky Way inside and out, and along the way, we'll get into some of its lingering mysteries. Each stop on our Milky Way tour includes two or three videos without interruption. First, we'll learn from Caitlin, Hank, and Reed what the Milky Way even looks like and how we know that. Imagine waking up one morning in a room you've never seen before. If someone asked, you'd probably have a pretty tough time trying to describe the shape of the building you were in since you'd never seen it from the outside. But that's basically what we're doing when we try to understand what the Milky Way looks like from our position inside it. These days we know a lot about our galaxy. It's a spiral and we're about three-fifths of the way out from the center in one of the arms. But it's taken thousands of years to figure that out. Ancient Greek and Arab astronomers could see that there was this big weird strip running across the sky and they weren't all agreed on what it was made of. Many of them thought it was an enormous collection of stars, but Aristotle had a different idea. He thought the Milky Way was a huge patch of the atmosphere on fire, and that it looked dim because it was so far away. Almost 2,000 years later, Galileo pointed his first telescope at the sky and proved Aristotle wrong for good. The Milky Way was a collection of stars. Once scientists knew that, the question became, what was the collection shaped like? There are basically two common shapes in the universe, the blob and the disk. Stars, planets, asteroids, and moons are all of the blob variety, and things like planetary rings and star systems are more or less flat disks. Since we see the Milky Way as a band across the sky, that means it's more like a disk. And the fact that the band is pretty narrow means that the solar system must be near the plane of the disk, the middle of the thin side. If we were closer to the top or bottom of the disk, the Milky Way would look much broader, and you might even be able to see some of its structure directly. And if you travel around Earth, you'll notice that the galaxy completely encircles our planet. So we must not be on its outside edge. The first person to investigate the situation more deeply than this was the British astronomer William Herschel around 1785. He broke up the night sky into more than 600 zones and used his telescope to count every star he could see in each zone. The dimmer a star looked, the farther away Herschel assumed it was. Using this information, he worked out what he thought the basic structure of the galaxy must be. Since he saw roughly the same number of stars in every direction, he concluded that we must be somewhere near the center of the Milky Way. More than 100 years later, the Dutch astronomer Jacobus Kaftein tried the same basic technique with photography and came to the same conclusion. Then in 1917, American astronomer Harlow Shapley tried a different method. He studied globular clusters, bright, dense groups of stars that you can see from very far away. Like Herschel before him, Shapley also assumed that dimmer clusters must be farther away. But he found something very different from what Herschel did. Shapley realized that if you mapped out these globular clusters, they formed a rough sphere, and more importantly, that most of these clusters were in one part of the night sky. He figured that the middle of the sphere corresponded with the middle of the galaxy, in which case Earth would be far from the center of the Milky Way. We now know he was right. Herschel and Captain were wrong because they didn't know that the galaxy is full of dust, which absorbs starlight and obscures our view of the farthest parts of the Milky Way. A few years after Shapley figured out our position within our galaxy, Edwin Hubble, another American astronomer, discovered that there were lots of other galaxies. From what we know about those other galaxies, plus what we've learned by using the tools of modern astronomy, we've been able to piece together an even better picture of the Milky Way. Dust doesn't block infrared light as much, so astronomers can use infrared telescopes to look right past it. And with radio telescopes, astronomers can ignore the stars themselves and map out the gas that makes up a lot of the galaxy. With these techniques, plus new, better methods of gauging distances, we've developed a much more detailed map of the Milky Way. But that doesn't mean we have everything figured out. Just in the last few years, astronomers have discovered that our galaxy has what's called a bar at its center, a rectangular region that joins together the Milky Way's spiral arms and might provide a nursery where new stars form. So it is harder to learn about our galaxy from our position inside it, but with careful observation and some good tools, we've been able to discover a lot about our corner of the universe. The universe's galaxies come in all shapes and sizes. There are shapeless blobs and smooth ellipses, but about three-quarters of galaxies have that classic spiral structure, including the Milky Way. Except, even though astronomers are surrounded by examples of galaxies like these, they still don't fully understand how these spirals form or how they keep their shape over billions of years. But they're working on getting to the bottom of it, because the better we understand the physics of spirals, the better we can understand the origin and the future of these galaxies and their stars, one of which we live around. The thing that makes this tricky is that a spiral galaxy doesn't work like a classic pinwheel. It looks like one, with its sweeping arms full of stars all rotating around the center. But if it worked like a pinwheel, the stars would be fixed within those arms and swept around as the galaxy rotated. And in reality, 
That's not what happens. Observations have shown that spiral galaxies do rotate, but the inner parts spin faster than the outer edges. So if stars were really fixed in place in the arms, the difference in rotation speed across the disk would slowly wind the arms tighter and tighter. And so eventually the arms would disappear. But it doesn't seem like that happens. Spiral galaxies can last for billions of years without losing their arms. This creates what's called the winding problem, and it tells us that there must be be something else going on. So if the spiral arms aren't fixed packs of stars, what are they? Well, in the 1960s, a pair of astronomers had a new idea. Maybe the arms are the areas where the stars just happen to be more densely packed. This is called the density wave theory, and it suggests that as stars orbit around the center of the galaxy, they pass in and out of these higher density regions. It's kind of like how cars pass in and out of a traffic jam. The part of the highway that's jammed up stays that way, even as individual cars move in and out. So according to this theory, as the spiral arms move around the center of the galaxy, the stars themselves move at a different speed in and out of the arms. Now, the theory did not suggest how these waves might get started in galaxies, but we know that density waves are like ripples in a pond. They come from some disturbance that sends waves moving outward. Except, since a galaxy is rotating instead of sitting still in a pond, its ripples create spirals instead of circles. And hypothetically, those spiraling ripples would interact to form spiral arms. At first, this was all based on simulations. Since everything happens on cosmic timescales, it's hard to actually see any of this in action. But one way astronomers have been able to find evidence for density wave theory is by testing some of its predictions. For one, if galaxies' spiral arms really did come from density waves, astronomers expect compressed gas in the dense regions to ignite into lots of new stars. And since the 1960s, astronomers have noticed that these galaxies' bright young stars are mostly concentrated in the spiral arms. More recently, in a 2016 study, researchers tested their prediction that stars travel at a different speed than the arms, and they did this by analyzing the position of stars of different ages in dozens of spiral galaxies. Since stars change color as they age, scientists could study specific age groups by isolating different colors of light. As expected, they found the youngest stars mostly in the arms, while older stars were typically located farther and farther away. It was pretty strong evidence that stars aren't fixed in the spiral arms, they're just passing through. To be fair, the density wave theory isn't the only explanation that's been suggested for spiral galaxies, but so far, these lines of evidence make it the leading idea. That said, there are still some big unanswered questions. Like, scientists still don't know what exactly could cause these density waves in the first place. Some have suggested that since many spiral galaxies have a bar at the center, maybe those bars set off ripples in the galactic disk as they rotate. Except, scientists think that the bars themselves are formed by density waves, which leaves the question of where those waves came from. Plus, not every spiral galaxy has a bar in the middle, so this can't be the only explanation. Another hypothesis is that density waves could be caused by smaller companion galaxies tugging at the disk from the outside. But sometimes spiral galaxies don't appear to have companion galaxies either. And like, they could just be too dim for us to see, but more likely, we need a better explanation. So maybe the answer is simpler than we think. Some simulations have suggested that spirals get going spontaneously from density fluctuations within the disk. You know, just like how traffic jams sometimes happen for no reason at all. But for now, scientists will need to keep studying spiral galaxies to make sense of their mysterious swirls. And the better we understand these distant spirals, the better we can understand the galaxy we live in and how it came to be. There is a supermassive black hole in the middle of our galaxy. It's as massive as about four million suns, and everything in the Milky Way orbits around the region where it lives. Studying it could even help us understand ideas as enormous as gravity. But for hundreds of years, no one was sure this thing was out there. Black holes don't emit light, and our instruments weren't advanced enough to hone in on the radio waves emitted by the matter that surrounds them. So for centuries, we were missing out on everything this object had to teach us. That is, until 1974, when, for the first time, a team of scientists was able to provide convincing evidence that it exists. Today, the black hole is called Sagittarius A star, and finding it was one of the biggest discoveries in astronomy. Here's how it happened. The story began in the 1930s at, of all places, a telephone company. At the time, a physicist named Carl Jansky was working for Bell Labs, and his job 
was to find anything that might cause static on transatlantic phone calls. For the most part, his job was pretty chill. Mainly, he just picked up static from thunderstorms. But then, there was this other source of static, which he was able to trace to interstellar space. It was coming from a region at the center of our galaxy called Sagittarius A, which gets its name from being in the constellation Sagittarius. Bell Labs didn't care to follow up on this, but astronomers did. Over the next few decades, they began studying this region and looking for whatever was emitting those radio waves. But unfortunately, even though they were getting strong signals, they didn't have telescopes sensitive enough to pick out a single source of this radiation. It's like their instruments were trying to recreate a picture of the sky, but with really big pixels. So if they tried to capture the source of the waves, they just got a blurry signal with a bunch of other objects in it. The good news is, radio astronomers didn't have to build one massive telescope dish to solve this problem. Instead, they used what's called a radio interferometer. There are a few types of interferometers, like the ones used to detect gravitational waves. But in this case, an interferometer is an array of two or more dishes that work together to collect signals from a single object. As the Earth turns, the dishes in an interferometer move in an arc. And as the Earth completes a rotation, the dishes trace out a circle. That circle can act like a giant virtual telescope dish. It takes some really sophisticated computer processing to sync up all the signals from different dishes at different times, but the results are worth it. Because in this setup, the telescope's resolution depends on the distance between the dishes instead of the size of a single dish. And that means you can get some really sensitive measurements. Without a solution like this, the first teams of astronomers to study Sagittarius A didn't have the resolution to pick out a compact source. But by the end of the 1960s, astronomers began to narrow in on the prize. One team of theorists published a paper suggesting that this mysterious radio source had enough energy to possibly be a black hole. Then, in 1971, a pair of astronomers used an interferometer in the UK to zoom in on the region. They were able to trace out some structure, but they still didn't have the resolution to find the object itself. Finally, in 1974, two astronomers focused in on this thing at long last. They used an interferometer in Green Bank, West Virginia, along with a telescope in the nearby town of Huntersville to create a virtual telescope with the resolution of a 35-kilometer dish. With this, they were able to pick out a single bright source within the signal, which they inferred was a black hole. In the paper they published about their research, they wrote that this black hole wasn't just at the center of the galaxy either. It likely defined the center. And this discovery was such a big deal that one of the scientists, Bob Brown, felt inspired to give the object its very nerdy name. Sagittarius A star. It might sound pretty normal as far as space names go, but Brown was actually inspired by atomic physicists. They use an asterisk to show that an atom is in an excited state. So he added an asterisk to Sagittarius A to denote the black hole. Because the discovery was exciting. Which is really kind of cute. And honestly, it was exciting. But this wasn't the end of all of this. Because at the time, scientists barely had enough resolution to identify that A star was a black hole. They couldn't actually figure out its mass or radius, which would have proven that beyond a doubt. Since 1974, we've needed decades of follow-up research to confirm the discovery and fill out our picture of this massive object and its immediate neighborhood. Understanding our black hole has taken the work of dozens of scientists from around the world. And in the early 2000s, all those researchers allowed us to finally get our proof. In 2002, a team based at UCLA discovered and tracked orbits of stars extremely close to the black hole. They used information from the star's orbits to determine the mass and radius, and to show once and for all that this couldn't be anything but a black hole. After all, it contains the mass of around 4 million suns in a space about as big as Mercury's orbit around the sun. And as far as we know, no other object could be that dense. So in the end, a story that began with static and phone calls led to one of the biggest discoveries in astronomy, a supermassive black hole some 26,000 
thousand light years away. But really, this story isn't over yet. Looking to the future, increasingly sensitive telescopes will continue to tell us more about Sagittarius A star and the area around it. Observing this object and other black holes will also help us test Einstein's ideas about gravity and the properties of space-time. And of course, there's the fact that we still haven't taken a proper picture of this thing. In April 2019, scientists shared the first picture of the edge of another black hole in the neighboring galaxy M87. Now, they aim to do the same for Sagittarius A star. And when that happens, we'll be able to see the object that scientists have been studying in the dark for more than four decades. Since the filming of that SciShow Space video, researchers have published images of Sagittarius A star. So now there's overwhelming evidence of that black hole in our galaxy. Over the decades, astronomers have pieced together what our galaxy looks like, but it hasn't always looked that way. Like all galaxies, the Milky Way changes over time. So here are two more videos that describe some of the ways our galaxy will change during our lifetimes and billions of years after we're gone. Compared to a human lifetime, timescales in space are enormous. So it's easy to imagine that our galaxy is basically frozen during the handful of decades that we're alive. After all, generations and generations of our ancestors have looked at the same planets and constellations that we see today. But that being said, galaxies are really dynamic, and the Milky Way is changing all the time. In fact, in your lifetime, let's call it 100 years, it will undergo some pretty amazing changes. For one, it will probably grow. Like, a lot. According to a 2018 paper, spiral galaxies like ours are steadily expanding at around 500 meters per second. That's roughly twice the speed of a jet. And if this rate also applies to the Milky Way, that means it will grow about 1.5 billion kilometers over the next century. That's not just a statistic, either. This number could also teach scientists about galactic evolution in general. See, the fact that these galaxies grow wasn't a total surprise. For years, scientists have known that every once in a while, they can eat up smaller galaxies that get captured by their gravity. But that 2018 paper was important because it confirmed that this isn't the only way these neighborhoods get bigger. They also expand because new stars are being born, and in a pretty odd place, too. In this study, researchers observed two spiral galaxies galaxies like ours. And after calculating how stars on the fringes were moving, they concluded that these galaxies were growing because stars were being born on their edges. Models had predicted this, but it was hard to prove that they were right just by looking at the Milky Way, since, well, were inside it. So by looking at other galaxies, scientists were able to confirm their hypothesis. This finding was mainly strange because most stars form toward the center of their galaxy. So this paper demonstrated that there can still be activity way out in the galactic outskirts. That means that even if it never interacts with another galaxy, the Milky Way will likely keep growing while you're alive as long as it has enough gas around the edges to make new stars. Of course, at this point in its life, our galaxy is making stars pretty slowly, churning out maybe one or two a year. But that means that in the course of your lifetime, it could gain around 100 new stars. Now, sure, for a place with at least 100 billion stars, that's barely a sprinkling. Things have slowed down now that our galaxy is well into adulthood at a healthy 13 and a half billion years old. It's a long ways from its wild youth, about 9 billion years ago, when it was forming around a dozen stars a year. Still, from a human perspective, 100 new stars is nothing to scoff at. And besides, understanding that number can also teach scientists about how the galaxy has evolved. Because the thing is, the Milky Way's star formation hasn't just tapered off. It's been more of a roller coaster. After that peak around 9 billion years ago, star formation dropped to a tenth of its previous rate. This shutdown happened around the same time that our galaxy formed its thick disk. Scientists aren't exactly sure how the two events are connected, but they think it's possible that the formation of this disk stirred things up and made the gas so hot that it stopped condensing into stars. Fortunately, star formation has picked up again since then, although these days, things are pretty quiet. Still, that's relatively normal for older neighborhoods like ours that don't have a lot of interaction with other galaxies. Even so, the Milky Way is popping out the occasional new star as regions of dust condense and ignite. 
And over the course of a century, our galaxy is likely to have dozens of new studs of light. Finally, the Milky Way won't just gain things during your lifetime, it will also lose some. After all, the Milky Way's new stars are just the recycled remains of old ones. And in the next hundred years, it will likely lose about as many stars as it gets. Two or three might even explode as supernovas. This will only happen to the really massive stars, but when they die, they'll spew their contents into space, and some of the elements from their cores will be incorporated into new stars. As far as we know, the most recent supernova in our galaxy blew up around 140 years ago. But a 2006 estimate suggests that, on average, the Milky Way has seen a supernova explode around every 50 years. So in a sense, it seems like we're kind of overdue for some fireworks. And scientists may have found the next culprit. They have their eyes set on a triple star system nicknamed APEP, which is about 8,000 light years away and seems to be on the brink of explosion, at least based on what we can see of it. One of its stars is releasing streams of charged particles at a speed that suggests it's at the point of collapse. Thankfully, because of the way the star is oriented, it shouldn't do any harm to Earth, even if we see evidence of that explosion soon. And either way, cosmic brinks can be human lifetimes, so it's hard to say exactly when this thing will go. We might not see evidence of its explosion for another thousand years or more. Whether or not the galaxy lights up with a new supernova in the near future, the Milky Way is far from the frozen river of stars that you've seen on a dark night. In your lifetime alone, dozens of stars will blink in and out of existence, and the whole galaxy will likely push its own boundaries by more than a billion kilometers. And it's not just cool to find events in space on the scale of our lives. Understanding these short-term events also helps us get a handle on how galaxies evolve and sort out what it's like to be in galactic middle age. For a long time, there was a strange mystery when it came to the question of how galaxies form. The best models predicted that a whole galaxy would form at the same time, but galaxies have stars with all kinds of different ages. So how do we explain that? Turns out that galaxies eat each other. We used to think that galaxies formed when huge clouds of gas in space collapsed inwards under the weight of their own gravity. Denser pockets of that cloud became stars, and most of the stars then got pulled into the center of the new galaxy by gravity. This is known as the primordial collapse model of galaxy formation, and it's not wrong. Clusters of stars do form that way, and some of those clusters are big enough that you could call them galaxies. But if primordial collapse were all there was to it, then all the stars in each galaxy should be about the same age, since they would have formed about the same time. Except they're not. For example, the oldest stars in the Milky Way are more than 13 billion years old. Meanwhile, our sun is only about four and a half billion years old. And in other places in the galaxy, new baby stars are forming right now. The best explanation for how all these differently aged stars can show up in the same galaxy is that they originally came from other galaxies, which then merged into one. When two galaxies are close enough, they're affected by each other's gravity. And if those two galaxies are of roughly the same size, they'll eventually merge. The new galaxy that formed during that merger will be much bigger, with twice the mass of either of its parent galaxies. And it'll have stars that could potentially be of vastly different ages, depending on the ages of its parents. That new galaxy might then be attracted towards another galaxy, and eventually they would end up merging too. If the process continues, you could end up with truly massive galaxies. All of this merging is appropriately called the hierarchical merger model of galaxy formation, and it's how we now think galaxies grow. Smaller things merge to make bigger things, which then merge to make even bigger things. But that's just galaxies combining. Neither of them really get destroyed. So it's not what scientists mean when they talk about galactic cannibalism. Instead, they're referring to what happens when one galaxy is a lot bigger than the other. Because in those situations, the bigger galaxy rips the smaller galaxy apart, sucking in its stars and dust and its dark matter halo, and leaving just a trail of star crumbs behind. That's galactic cannibalism. And it's actually really common. Even the Milky Way is in the process of cannibalizing at least four different smaller galaxies right now. First, there's the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, which we're in the final stages 
stages of consuming. Once upon a time, this was one of the Milky Way's brightest satellite galaxies. But over the past billion years, the Milky Way has dispersed and absorbed half of its stars and nearly all of its clouds of gas. The prognosis for the rest of this dwarf galaxy isn't good either. It's still being pulled apart by the Milky Way's gravity. There's also the Canis Major dwarf galaxy, which was only discovered in 1994, despite being our closest galactic neighbor, at only 48,000 light years away. That's because it's pretty much gone. It's been pulled to pieces by the Milky Way's gravity so totally that when it was first discovered, scientists weren't even sure if it was a galaxy. Some of them thought it was just a weird bump on one of the Milky Way's arms. And then there's the large and small Magellanic clouds, which we've only just started to snack on. Like the others, these are dwarf galaxies that orbit the Milky Way. And according to a study published in 2014 by the Oxford University Press, they're already beginning to deform as the Milky Way pulls them inward. The astronomers who wrote the paper, who are based out of the University of Western Australia, gave these beautiful space clouds about four billion years before they're just another snack for the Milky Way. But the Milky Way will eventually get its comeuppance when it's devoured by the larger Andromeda galaxy in about five billion years. The Andromeda galaxy, in turn, will most likely merge into a massive conglomeration of all the galaxies in the Virgo cluster, and they might end up being eaten by the Shapley Supercluster, a collection of galaxies about 650 million light years away. But that doesn't necessarily mean that every star and galaxy in the universe will eventually end up in a giant terrifying cannibal star blob. That's because the universe is expanding, and the force of gravity decreases the farther away two objects get. So as the space between galaxies increases, mergers and collisions get less and less common. Across great enough distances, the power of attraction of even the most massive objects in the universe won't be strong enough to overcome the speed of the universe's expansion. But until we reach that point, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there even when the dogs are galaxies. We might already know how our galaxy dies, but there's still plenty of story left to tell. Researchers have been trying to figure out what happened to its missing satellite galaxies, why its stars cluster in those swirls, and other giant galactic questions for decades. Here are some of those questions and possible answers that researchers have come up with. The Milky Way is our home, so you'd think we'd know a lot about it. And we do. But a whole galaxy is a pretty big place. So there's still plenty of weird stuff that we're trying to figure out. And that's the cool stuff. So here are three questions scientists are still trying to puzzle out. One is our galaxy's shape. We know that we live in a spiral galaxy with long, sweeping arms packed with stars. But why is it like that? After all, stars form from a fog of gas and dust called the interstellar medium, or ISM. And the ISM is everywhere within the galaxy. So why do stars congregate in the arms? Well, well, we don't totally know, but we're making progress. One clue comes from structures called filaments that astronomers in the 1980s started to find at the cores of some galactic arms. Filaments are dense regions of the ISM that are incredibly thin, up to a hundred times longer than they are wide. They can stretch for hundreds of light years, but weirdly seem to exist on all size scales kind of like a fractal. Together, they form a sort of galactic skeleton for the Milky Way, providing ingredient-rich places for new stars to form. The European Space Agency's Herschel Space Observatory has even found filaments connecting all the closest star-forming regions. But exactly how many of these structures there are, and how they play a role around here, is still up for debate. And that's not the only mystery our galaxy's stars present. As astronomers have mapped out the positions and speeds of nearby stars more accurately, they've found they're less predictable than expected. Instead of mostly circling in a flat plane, a research group discovered in 2012 that many stars seem to be moving up or down about 10% as fast as they're circling the galactic center. When mapped out at large scale, the Milky Way stars even seem to be rippling with waves. Studying these waves is called galactoseismology, and like the study of seismic waves here on Earth, it may reveal clues about unseen events. The waves are probably the result of a big collision with the Milky Way, but where's the collider? Researchers aren't sure, but they think there are two likely possibilities, both of which would have happened about 100 million years ago. One's kind of standard, an interaction between our galaxy and one of its many satellite galaxies. The other, though, is really cool. It's possible that the Milky Way collided with a massive dark matter structure, and its gravity stirred up all those stars. Although we can't see dark matter, we know it's all around us, especially near our galaxy's outer edges. But just because we can't find the culprit doesn't mean it's gotta be dark matter. Whatever the collision was, its trajectory probably carried the other object to a place beyond the galactic core and basically out of sight from Earth. There's also at least one piece of evidence suggesting a dwarf galaxy might have been the culprit instead. Astronomers have found a few stars traveling so fast that they couldn't have come from our galaxy, so they might have been knocked loose during that big collision. 
Either way, we'll have to work fast to figure this out, because those waves of stars will probably disappear in another hundred million years. Then again, maybe we won't have to work very fast at all. Finally, stars aren't the only thing traveling weirdly fast around here. For decades, astronomers have observed a few clouds of gas moving at strangely high velocities, up to 90 kilometers per second faster than the stuff around them. At that speed, it would take only a year and a half to travel from the Sun out to Neptune. Always on the lookout for a clever name, researchers call them high-velocity clouds. These clouds are mostly found in the outer halo region of the Milky Way, and they're often observed to have a low metallicity or abundance of heavier elements. And they're not small, either. They can contain millions of times more material than the Sun and span tens of thousands of light years. Scientists have four main ideas about where they might have come from. The oldest hypothesis, proposed by famous astronomer Jan Oort, suggests that the clouds might be the far-flung leftovers of the process that formed the Milky Way. With only the weakest gravitational pull affecting them, that far-off material would have taken billions of years to get here, speeding up along the way. Another idea is that because they do have such low metallicity, high-velocity clouds are the remnants of an ancient collision between the Milky Way and another galaxy. Hey, where have we heard that before? A related hypothesis is that the material is made up of gas stolen gravitationally from a satellite galaxy. That seems especially likely for the clouds found in the Southern Hemisphere, which is in the direction of the Magellanic Clouds, our closest galactic neighbors. One last idea is that these clouds actually came from the Milky Way all along. Perhaps a powerful supernova explosion hurled them away from the galaxy's disk, only for gravity to claw them back before they could fully escape. There's even a chance different clouds could have different origin stories. To figure that out, astronomers are studying the composition of each cloud in detail. If they were created in different ways, there might be a signature of their home still waiting to be detected. We'll just have to wait for the results. We don't yet know the answers to any of these Milky Way mysteries, or many others out there. But put them all together, and our galaxy suddenly seems a lot less isolated and our cosmic neighborhood a lot busier. The Milky Way is more than two million light years from the next big galaxy, but that doesn't mean we're alone out here. There are actually a few dozen smaller satellite galaxies orbiting ours, keeping us company in the neighborhood. Over the years, they've taught us about star formation and how galaxy clusters behave, so they've been really useful to astronomers. Except there's a problem. Some satellite galaxies seem to be, well, missing. In 1998, two independent laboratories noticed that there's a big difference between the number of satellites that simulations predict and the number we've actually seen with telescopes. It's called the missing satellite problem. And since we've noticed it, no one's been able to figure out exactly what's going on yet. Our galaxy has at least 100 billion stars, but its satellites are much tinier. Specifically, they're dwarf galaxies, or those that typically have less than a billion stars. We've been looking at them for centuries, since several of them, like the Large Magellanic Cloud, can be spotted with the naked eye. But it's only in the last few decades that we've given them serious attention. Among other things, they're great models for how larger galaxies should behave, which has helped scientists test ideas about everything from stellar activity to chemistry. Understanding them could also help us figure out how our own galaxy formed. So astronomers have put a lot of effort into estimating how many should be out there. Many of these studies have involved computer simulations. They're based on the behavior and amount of dark matter in the Milky Way neighborhood. The matter which we can't see, but helps hold galaxies together. They also take into account what we know about the laws of gravity and the universe's expansion. These models suggest that there should be hundreds or even thousands of satellites out there, including plenty massive enough to be visible through telescopes. But we've only seen a few dozen. Since 2005, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey has found almost 20, and since 2013, the Dark Energy Survey has spotted about 20 more. With other findings, that brings the total to about 60. And when scientists extrapolate and apply those results to unstudied parts of the sky, they only estimate that there are a hundred or so satellites floating around. That's still significantly less than the simulations predict, and that might mean something is a bit off with our work so far. It could be that astronomers have been calculating the telescope extrapolations wrong. So right now, some researchers are working on recalibrating the statistics from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Survey. On the other hand, it could be that something is wrong with the models. The good news is, this probably doesn't mean our basic understanding of dark matter is wrong. That would be a hard truth to swallow, and would require a lot more evidence. Instead, it might just mean some small details need to be tweaked, or that other factors are at play. For example, 
A few cosmologists have thrown around the idea that dark matter might operate differently on different scales. And research from 2013, published in the Journal of the Italian Astronomical Society, suggests the solution might have to do with the conditions of the early universe. Thankfully, whatever the solution is, cosmologists are no strangers to reconciliation. They come across problems and exceptions in research all the time, so they'll keep working on this case, too. Basically, that's how science works. And there are already some big projects on the way to help us track down those missing satellites. For one, telescopes are getting more powerful all the time, which will help. In 2022, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, operated by Aura, is scheduled to come online. It will be able to look at 10 square degrees of the sky at once, an area almost 50 times the size of the moon. That means it will be able to look at more of the Milky Way and its surroundings in greater detail than any any other telescope to date. It also helps the computers are getting faster, and cosmologists are already using them to enhance their models and simulations. Some simulations, like some being run at the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics, pair dark matter simulations with machine learning. They study hypothetical galaxies to figure out how many dwarf galaxies we'd expect to survive in the real universe. And other models, like the super high-resolution fire simulations, model both dark matter and non-dark matter at the same time to get a more accurate view of how dwarf galaxies form in the first place. These studies all hope to emerge with a more accurate picture of our corner of space, which will hopefully help us figure out what's going on with all those missing satellites. While astronomers have gotten better at finding those missing satellite galaxies, that telescope under construction to collect data on them won't get started until at least 2023. Meanwhile, simulations created in the last few years predict there should actually be fewer satellites than there really are, which makes even less sense. But when astronomers fiddle with the dark matter in their simulations, new predictions appear to match observations better. So we might be closer to solving one of these mysteries, but the Milky Way is big enough to keep us intrigued for centuries, and really, until the end of human civilization. If you have questions about the Milky Way or other space stuff, you can go to patreon.com slash scishowspace and become a space cadet. Space cadets can ask questions that sometimes spark entire SciShow Space videos. In those cases, the topic of SciShow Space videos is all thanks to you. And ultimately, each SciShow Space video is thanks to you supporting the channel and watching. So thank you for your support.